People at all levels uh, need to have a discussion about money. They need to understand where money comes from, how it's issued, who's, who's issuing it. In the case we, in the United States, we have the Federal Reserve. Um, this is something that you do not get in high school, you do not get in college, and you're probably not going to get it in a lot of your work environment. Even if you're working for a bank, you're not really trained in how the money system works. There's only a handful of people that really uh, truly understand how our Federal Reserve system works that creates all the money we're using. The market opened in an absolutely free fall, and uh, some people couldn't even get any bids for their shares, and it was wild panic. And uh, an ugly crowd gathered outside the stock exchange, and uh, it was described as making uh, weird and threatening noises. It was indeed. Uh, one of the worst days that had ever been seen down there. Rip off the American public. All right, Take so our money and run with it. Bush and Carlson are taking our hard-earned tax dollars to buy useless junk financial instruments from Wall Street, right? That have no value. They're just going to assign an arbitrary value on it just to infuse a lot of cash into the pockets of the people that got us into this mess. You don't, you don't actually get anything from your taxes at all at this point. I think that's just taking advantage of a crisis in order to frighten the American people into submission. Don't believe what you want. for a long time always thought of debt as something to be avoided at all costs because it does lead to slavery as it says in the Bible borrower becomes slave to the lender there is a definite connection between debt and slavery you'll hear we live in a service society uh, banking is considered a service industry uh, America is moving towards a service uh, economy service 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 but if we look at the word service we find the word uh, service in English comes directly from the Latin the word servus, which is S-E-R-V-U-S, and the Latin word servus means slave. The United States economy is the greatest wealth creation machine the world has ever known. And it works to the extent that it's allowed to take the unfettered creativity and energy of the American population and create new things and give them a reason to expect that they're going to be able to reap the benefits of those investments and inventions and creative activities. The US government is incapable of creating wealth and uh, new income on its own because all it does is move money around. The problem is over the last, in some ways since 1983, 1984 in the first Reagan administration, but especially under the Bush administration, Bush administration has actually been the largest tax increasing administration in American history. And that seems odd when you first think of it because in some ways the Bush administration reduced tax rates. But by reducing tax rates and then fighting a war that where we're spending billions of dollars every day somewhere else, we're increasing 
our annual debt. The sum of the annual debt is the deficit. So my son, my older son, my younger son, each of them owe thirty-seven, thirty-eight thousand dollars to the government because those are future taxes. The thing I think people don't realize is that uh, the federal deficit is future taxes. So we are now being enslaved uh, by the federal government in a way because we're, I've got a $37,000 mortgage I didn't ask for and so do both of my sons. That's going to have to be paid off. A lot of people that uh, might uh, have gone to church sometime in their life and possibly recited the Lord's Prayer, uh, they may have been confused sometimes. Sometimes you'll go into a, a, a church and the people will recite it. Uh, they'll talk about, you know, our Father who art in heaven, da da da, and you get to the point where it says, uh, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Uh, some versions translated as forgive us our uh, debts as we forgive those who have, are indebted to us. Others translated as forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. So there's these three different versions that floating around out there. And uh, the reason for that uh, difference is if you look again back into the derivation of the words, uh, in the language that uh, Jesus spoke in, uh, Aramaic, uh, in Aramaic, uh, which the Lord's Prayer was given in, in Aramaic, uh, the word for sin and debt uh, was the same word. So when translators had to translate, they weren't sure which way to translate. Did he mean sin? Did he mean debt? But obviously back to the ancient uh, uh, Aramaeans, uh, they felt that there was enough of a correlation between the two words that it was really not worth separating them. So we have a word that simply means both sin and debt, which obviously sin is not a good thing, so you might tend to think that debt might not be a good thing. Bondage is a great word. I think everybody understands that bondage is not something you want to be in, but uh, nobody thinks twice about going out and voting in their local elections for the school bond or the uh, parks and recreations bond, uh, but the word, where the word bond, you know, there's a con connection there between the word bond and bondage. Obviously bondage is derived from the word bond, which means to bind somebody in some way. And so in effect what we're doing in these bond sales is we're binding people uh, to contracts, uh, which in certain cases could be you know, construed as uh, tying yourself into a, uh, some kind of a bondage situation and what is bondage but slavery. A lot of people have purchased uh, federal debt. A lot of people have overspent on their own homes because we have a system that fosters not just intellectually but also in legal terms easy debt, easy credit. And as a result many people are in a position partly because of the, re the reduction of home prices they're in a position where they, they really have no realistic hope ever of getting out of debt. And we, we can't, one thing we know we can't do is say we're going to declare a debt holiday like some country in Africa or South America might do. But what is the solution? What's going to change? Now, I think the only thing that happens, is, that could happen, is individuals start showing more responsibility. That's not going to happen until the government does. We are in the midst of a serious financial crisis, and the federal government is responding. My administration is working with Congress to address the root cause behind much of the instability in our markets. The original definition of usury is the charging of interest on a loan. Uh, today it's been translated now as the charging of excessive interest. But that is a modern definition. For thousands of years, the definition was the charging of interest on a loan. Um, going back as far as Aristotle uh, and the early uh, leaders in the, in the Jewish, Christian, Muslim faiths, uh, they all saw usury, the charging of interest on a loan, as immoral or unnatural in the case of Aristotle. Uh, why? Because money intrinsically is supposed to be a medium of exchange. It is not a good or a service like a car that you might rent or loan out or charge rent on when you lease a car or, or when you rent a house. Money is supposed to be a medium of exchange. It's supposed to avail people in society the ability to move goods and services. It's not supposed to be something on its own that generates wealth. Whether I take a dollar bill and put it on this table or if I take even a gold coin 
Uh, this says the head of Queen Elizabeth on it, a king or a queen. Anyway, if I take a gold coin and put it on the table, you know, it on its own can't do work. Yet we've created this system where we believe that somehow in giving this money to other people, um, it, it has this potential to generate wealth. And really it can't generate wealth on its own. It's got to be employed in some way to uh, a useful purpose to create an increase in goods and services. The early uh, philosophers uh, in Greek and Roman times, the, uh, the great religious leaders and the great faiths of the world, they all saw this pretty clearly. And that uh, basically what you have to have is investment. Investment involves risk. Okay, risk is kind of the opposite of usury. A person, who practiced, a person who was practicing usury was trying to get a gain without risking anything. He was technically, he could be risking if his loan didn't get paid back, but essentially what he's asking for is, regardless of the outcome of your use of my money, I want a return. Whereas what was being preached by the uh, you know, religious uh, uh, teachers was that you should have to take a risk with your money and if the risk was paid off and it was a profitable venture, you would get a return on your money. If the risk, was un if the risk turned out to be unprofitable, you'd be out your money. That's the way it should work, risk-benefit. When you create a, a system of charging interest, regardless of what happens with the money, you're setting yourselves up in this kind of moral hazard situation where the person is tempted to just loan the money out, knowing that they're going to get some interest on it. And what's, what's interesting is, if you look at what's happened, particularly over the last few years in the uh, world economy with all the loans that were being given out for homes, everybody wanted to own their own home, well, you had people that really had no ability to pay uh, back a lot of the loans. You had people that were buying homes for prices that were far in excess of what the homes were really worth. You created this system where people were chasing everything because they felt like, well, if I could loan money out and get interest back and then finagle all these contracts, if I combine all these contracts together, I can sell them as a, some kind of investment vehicle type thing that has a guaranteed rate of return to an investor, yada, yada. You create this whole system that's based on this concept of, you know, basically uh, money chasing and, and, and imagining that somehow money on its own manipulated can create wealth. And, and that's just not the way reality works. And yet we have this whole system uh, based on that. Uh, that's why usury was viewed as an evil uh, practice. One of the first things that happened in the forming of the country uh, was when the, 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 um, the founding fathers came together to uh, create the Constitution, uh, one of the elements uh, that was discussed was the having a central bank, and that was the big debate. That was one of the major debates between the, the Jeffersonians and the Hamiltonians. Uh, Thomas Jefferson wanted, uh, you know, to be free of debt. They wanted to, uh, you know, he viewed debt as, the, I think his quote was something to the effect of, you know, debt is the, the national debt is the mortal canker of the nation that has to be uh, resolved and paid down. It's uh, something that's obviously very dangerous. Uh, Alexander Hamilton, on the other hand, was arguing in favor of a central bank, that there should be some central authority uh, that issues the money, uh, in the country. Uh, Jefferson won in the first round, then the central bank did come into being. Uh, it was eventually uh, taken out under the reign of uh, Andrew Jackson, and we did not see a central bank in the United States again until uh, 1913 uh, under the passage of the 16th Amendment, uh, which was basically the Federal Reserve Act. Um, and then the United States has had a central bank ever since then. We went from having a money system that was either you know, gold and silver, uh, bullion coins, uh, you know, real uh, items that had real intrinsic value, items that took uh, real labor and work to produce. Uh, this was the foundation of our monetary system uh, up until the founding of the Federal Reserve. And the creation of the Federal Reserve, then we create, we had the uh, ability for the Federal Reserve to start issuing Federal Reserve notes, which is a fiat currency that they could just issue. Uh, these Federal Reserve notes under the Federal Reserve system, what happens is they're not even just printed as uh, counter, you know, I don't want to say counterfeit money, but they're not just printed as fiat money out of the blue. They're printed as fiat money that has to be created through 
a convoluted, a relatively simple, but they make it appear to be a convoluted system whereby uh, the Treasury of the United States issues a Treasury bill. It's purchased by the Federal Reserve or other people. The money gets created in that process. And so what ends up happening, though, is this fiat money that comes into being under the Federal Reserve System, the fiat money is actually uh, money that has to ha is uh, created out of a system of debt where the, tre the Treasury bill is something that has to be paid off with interest. So you have this interest-bearing contract Treasury bill that's used in the creation of the Federal Reserve notes that we circulate, you know, these, these little things that we circulate in our wallets, uh, these Federal Reserve notes are created as part of a, uh, a debt service contract, which is a U.S. Treasury note. So uh, what happens is people that are aware of the system will often talk of the fiat currency as a debt-based fiat currency uh, that we're using, the U.S. Uh, Federal Reserve note. And again, when we're back to the situation of, well, wait, if it's a, if it's a debt-based currency, then all this money we're trading is based on debt, and debt is not that far away from the issue, the original uh, uh, ancient concept of slavery and that you know once you're indebted uh, you you have to pay now we we can say we have a choice in in whether we take on debt and everything but really in the United States uh, very few individuals feel they have much choice and as to how uh, debt is taken on whether it's by their local government for a, a city pool or a park or a school or whether it's by the federal government for all the myriad of programs the federal government runs, uh, these things are all being funded with uh, debt-based contracts. You know, bonds are being sold. Um, and what's interesting, I think it is interesting that we call these things bonds, because what ends up happening then is our governments are involved, our local, state, and federal governments are involved in essentially selling us into bondage. And that, you know, we are on the hook. When people buy these bonds, uh, they are buying them with the anticipation or with the understanding that the full faith and credit of the issuing governing authority will make sure that money will be pulled out of somebody to make the payment on the principal and the interest on those bonds. And so what ends up happening is citizens, whether at the city or the municipal level, the county level, state level, federal level, citizens, we as citizens are being trapped under this crushing burden of debt bondage. I know that when I talk to people about monetary policy or about the, what I see as the danger of having a Federal Reserve with effectively no restrictions on its discretion, it, it just seems too arcane. Now oh, the money supply, you know, I've got dollars, other people will take them. It doesn't matter. And we, if, if, you, if you ask people, they'll say, well, there, isn't there a gold standard? There, there hasn't been for more than 30 years. The U.S. dollar is not backed by anything. And the rate of growth of the money supply is not controlled by anything. As an economist, I'm absolutely convinced that inflation, as Milton Friedman said, is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. The sort of external cost push story, that raises prices, but it raises relative prices. And the economy re-equilibrates pretty quickly. The problem comes when the Federal Reserve expands the rate of growth of the money supply and, and accommodates that growth. We also have in some ways the worst kind of monetary system you could imagine, because in some ways we have a private system. But our private system is based on debt. So the Federal Reserve produces some new money, but not all that much. What happens is that every time I spend with my credit card, if I buy a th something for $1,000 on my credit card, that's $1,000 of new money. Federal Reserve has no control over that. It's an increase in the currency, and it's not backed by anything. So if the Federal Reserve's, I, I could imagine something short of a commodity-based currency if we would do these two things. One is, have the Federal Reserve charged only with managing inflation? And the second is, have the, the, the form of that take a fixed monetary growth rule where it, it grows no more than between 1 and 2 percent per year. And if it grows more than that, they have to use open market operations to shrink the rate of growth of the money supply. I think that's completely politically impossible. So the reason that many people propose a commodity-based system is that we, we, we wouldn't have to worry about the discretion of the Federal Reserve. We wouldn't have to worry about the discretion of this non-elected, completely unaccountable group of people who mostly owe their loyalty to the financial system. The Federal Reserve is not part of the federal government directly. It is a cartel of private banks operating under a federal charter. 
an intrinsic problem in the, in the fiat money system, uh, the way it's set up right now, is when the money's created, uh, when the money's created, uh, only the principles created. So if, you, if the U.S. Treasury bill, uh, or the U.S. Treasury uh, bill is uh, issued for $100 billion, uh, what ends up happening is when the Federal Reserve notes come into the system to purchase that $100 million Treasury bill, uh, all that comes into the system is $100 million, but the Treasury bill has an interest component tacked onto it. Could be three, you know, depending on what the interest rates are being manipulated to at the, at the time. Could be two, three, five, seven percent interest. Well, there's a problem. The intrinsic problem is this, is the money's created for the principal, but then the money's never created for the interest. So the only way to be able to pay back the interest is to basically create this game of musical chairs where new money's constantly being created uh, as debt, debts are being paid off with interest, so the interest to pay off the debts of the old money is being gotten from getting the new money, but the new money also has debt attached to it with interest, so you never can get ahead of the system. You're always having to create new money that's debt money with interest to pay off old money that's got debt plus interest, and you're using this new money to pay the, the principal plus the interest, and you never get ahead of the system. And it's like a musical chair game where you, you got to keep the music playing. Of create, you have to continually create new debt to keep everybody in the game able to pay off their old debt with interest. And what ends up happening every once in a while, and we may be coming to that point right now in our, in our financial system, is you've created this huge debt pyramid that can't possibly, the way the system's designed, you can never pay it off. And so everybody ends up with more and more and more and more debt. And at some point, you get this inverted pyramid of debt, this you know, Ponzi scheme of debt, and the, the system has to collapse under its own weight because there's just, it's intrinsically unstable. And uh, we may be reaching that point now where there's going to have to be just this huge default on debt because nobody, you know, the music's going to stop. They can't keep creating money uh, out of nowhere. Uh, you know, the debt numbers are getting too big. You can't justify giving more debt to people that are already overloaded with debt. So in a sense, when the, the money creation stops, the music stops, and everybody's going to have to run for the chairs, and there's not going to be enough chairs. Uh, some people are going to be left without a chair, and they're going to be wiped out. And the question is, you know, what's I, you know, where do you think you stand in this process? Do you think you're going to be one of the pe people that uh, are smart enough or privileged enough to get to a chair to sit on? Or are you going to be one of the people that is left frozen out without a chair? I know many Americans have questions tonight. How did we reach this point in our economy? How will the solution I propose work? And what does this mean for your financial future? This rescue effort is not aimed at preserving any individual company or industry. It will help American consumers and businesses get credit to meet their daily needs and create jobs. It is aimed at preserving America's overall economy. And it will help send a signal to markets around the world 
that America's financial system is back on track. I believe companies that make bad decisions should be allowed to go out of business. Under normal circumstances, I would have followed this course. But these are not normal circumstances. The market is not functioning properly. The government's top economic experts warn that without immediate action by Congress, America could slip into a financial panic and a distressing scenario would unfold. More banks could fail, including some in your community. The stock market would drop even more, which would reduce the value of your retirement account. The value of your home could plummet. Foreclosures would rise dramatically. And if you own a business or a farm, you would find it harder and more expensive to get credit. More businesses would close their doors, and millions of Americans could lose their jobs. Even if you have good credit history, it would be more difficult for you to get the loans you need to buy a car or send your children to college. And ultimately, our country could experience a long and painful recession. I know that an economic rescue package will present a tough vote for many members of Congress. It is difficult to pass a bill that commits so much of the taxpayers' hard-earned money. I also understand the frustration of responsible Americans who pay their mortgages on time, file their tax returns every April 15th, and are reluctant to pay the cost of excesses on Wall Street. But given the situation we are facing, not passing a bill now would cost these Americans much more later. Many Americans are asking, how would a rescue plan work? After much discussion, there is now widespread agreement on the principles such a plan would include. It would remove the risk posed by the troubled assets, including mortgage-backed securities, now clogging the financial system. This would free banks to resume the flow of credit to American families and businesses. Any rescue plan should also be designed to ensure that taxpayers are protected. It should welcome the participation of financial institutions, large and small. It should make certain that failed executives do not receive a windfall from your tax dollars. It should establish a bipartisan board to oversee the plan's implementation. And it should be enacted as soon as possible. The plan is big enough to solve a serious problem. Our 21st century global economy remains regulated largely by outdated 20th century laws. Recently, we've seen how one company can grow so large that its failure jeopardizes the entire financial system. Earlier this year, Secretary Paulson proposed a blueprint that would modernize our financial regulations. For example, the Federal Reserve would be authorized to take a closer look at the operations of companies across the financial spectrum and ensure that their practices do not threaten overall financial stability. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders.